to show where we were. So then Bodley, we've already talked about that. By 1815, well, there's still a lot of local areas that do not have any form of territorial state. Uh, Diamond, Jared Diamond, in a book called Guns, Germs, and Steel. How many of you heard of Guns, Germs, and Steel? Uh, it won a Pulitzer Prize, which is a, a literary as well as intellectual prize. And um, he asked questions in this book, uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, The Fates of Human Societies. Now, this is a section from that book. He says, let's return to the question about the rise of food production. I'm sorry if you can't see the whole thing. It's very small. It says, where, when, and how did food production develop? And he has a different view. It's not a state, but the particular environment matters too. So you can add Carniero and Diamond's idea. He says, at one extreme are areas in which food production was totally independent. And that means it's dependent on a local region. In other areas, they adapted crops from elsewhere. They took animals from elsewhere. And he says you can look at all of world history in terms of the material regions. Domesticated plants. They're available in Southwest Asia. This is the Mesopotamian area. In China, rice and millet. And the animals available were pigs and silkworms. And this is very old, where humans began to domesticate and use these animals. And we use these animals, he says, to build our hierarchies. Think about this. The point is, not everywhere had the same materials. And not everywhere had materials. Sometimes a society does not have access to animal power. How are you going to have a strong agriculture? without the material use of an ox or a cow. Uh, it says Ethiopia. They might have had coffee, but they didn't have any large animals available to build a society. Uh, New Guinea. New Guinea remained in hunter and gatherer arrangements until the present day. Um, they had domestication for 10,000 years, but they, they didn't have any big animals options. And this, this matters greatly for where large-scale states develop, first he says. He says, in three or four such areas, the arriving founder package came from Southwest Asia. So the early areas influenced other areas and dominated them with the expansion of their farmers. Um, let's look at a few more uh, graphs uh, in his book. It said, in short, only a few areas of the world developed food production independently, and they did so at different times. From those nuclear small areas, that means isolated areas, hunter-gatherers of some neighboring areas learned food production, and peoples of other neighboring areas were replaced by invading food producers. And in 1850, half the world still was not in a large-scale framework. How can we explain these geographic differences in the times and modes of food production? That question, one of the most important problems of prehistory, will be the subject of the next five chapters. And what he does, uh, he goes through and looks at different regions and what they had available. And as I said, you know, some regions, they don't have anything available for animals or for other options. This is perhaps the most interesting graph. He argues that in the area of Mesopotamia, this is the first, well, most people argue, the very first example of a territorial state and large urbanization. He says, that area has a huge number of large species, large seeds. And East Asia, all of it has a total of six. So there seem to be uh, a lot more wealth of the environment in some regions of the world than others that made it easier for large organizations to develop first in some regions of the world. It says here, this table 12.1 of someone's PhD dissertation, seed, weight, and environment in Mediterranean-type grasslands. It said, if you look at the world's 50 
86 heaviest seeded wild grasses. So you can still get, you know, where are the wild grasses in the world? And excluding baboons, for which data were available. The grain weight in those species was 10 milligrams, very small, to a seed that was over 40 milligrams, or about 10 times greater than the average for all the world's grass species. These 56 species are less than 1% of the world's grass, but this 1%, 33 of them were in one region of the world. 33 of these big seeds were in one region of the world. And he analyzes seeds in this way, and then looks at animals in this way. The importance of domesticated animals rests on a surprisingly few species. Um, he says these are the ancient 14 species of big domestic animals. You know, sheep, goat, cow, pig, horse, that's it. What if your region doesn't have a horse? What if your region doesn't have a pig? Basically, you stay small scale and you connect to the local region. Um, he says the minor nine, you might have camels, uh, two humped camel, llama, alpaca. These were so important in the state of the Incan Empire that they were all state property. Nobody had a private, private animal. So the animals were the basis for the state. You couldn't think of the environment as separate from the state. The state was built on the back of the llama and the forced taxation. If you didn't have a llama, it'd be very hard to develop moving materials back and forth for a state. So it's very important to think about the material context. Um, what if you didn't have a water buffalo to help you with rice planting? Maybe you have a very small kind of rice planting, but you can have a huge state-organized rice planting if you could raise water buffalo on large numbers. Yak. Yaks are very important for many different areas of the Himalayas, the Plateau, for everything. Without the yak, people couldn't live in this cold area because from the yak, they get uh, fiber for clothing, they get meat, they get D butter, which is the, the female, the female yak. They get milk, and you know, they get transportation. So, you know, the civilization is built on the back of the yak in this area. The same way with all things, he says. Where are those animals? The animals, he says, for candidates. I don't have time to talk about this idea of candidates, but there's a lot more candidates, a lot more choices within Eurasia, if you, this is the, the Bible here. Sub-Saharan Africa, domesticated species, zero! There were no domesticated species indigenous in Africa, which made it very hard to develop large-scale states. So that's, that's a big macro theory. Percentage of candidates domesticated. Eurasian areas, this means from Europe to China, <clears throat> they can domesticate 18% over 10,000 years. They make a good basis for transportation. You know, without horses, we couldn't build a state. For most of human history, the horse, when people begin to ride the horse, that is the beginning of the state, too. Uh, in the Americas, very small. And this historically was a place that didn't have very durable states. Australia, Europe. The Australian Aborigines, who remained hunter and gatherer for a very long time until the Europeans invade their land. So, his main theme is the inequalities of the environment contributed to inequalities of people over time. That it's not that some people are stupid. They may be very, very smart. Maybe smarter. But they don't have access to things that make their life easier. And that is, I think, an excellent contribution to, to macro theories here.